Good morning. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us today. I'm pleased to moderate this opening panel of discussion, which gets to the heart of why we're here today, gun violence, a public health crisis. We have assembled an esteemed group of health industry experts to explain why they believe gun violence, which takes 40,000 firearm, which causes 40,000 firearm related deaths annually, why this should be classified as a public health crisis in the same vein as an infectious disease epidemic or a public health emergency like vaping. So joining us today, we have two experts. I'd like to welcome Dr. Daniel Webster and Dr. Susan Bornstein. Hello. Doctors, can you please introduce yourself to us and tell us about a gun violence project or initiative that you're currently working on that excites you? Dan. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm Sue Bornstein. I'm an internal medicine physician by training and I'm here representing the American College of Physicians. Um, and uh, some of you, a lot of you probably know that the ACP has really a long standing interest in reducing firearm violence, injury, and death um, going back 25 years. Um, and I had the uh, privilege uh, of serving as chair of our Health and Public Policy Committee during a very interesting time, which was last fall uh, and the end of October, when our um, paper, updated paper on reducing firearms injury and violence was released. And uh, most of you are probably familiar with the infamous tweet um, telling uh, us to, that we should stay in our lane. And uh, I will, can tell you that um, I have never in my years of medicine seen any sort of an uprising, an upwelling, whatever you wanna call it, uh, of emotion that had been clearly pent up for years. We had physicians, we had nurses, we had technicians, administrators, everyone that's involved in the healthcare team, because let's face it, everyone on the healthcare team is affected by this terrible epidemic. Um, and uh, you probably saw posting uh, some very graphic photographs of uh, things that people on the front line have to deal with every day. It really touched a nerve and it created a movement. And so I think there's been a lot of work that's been done by people in this room, but I think the, the series of incidents that, that precipitated that tweet really galvanized the medical community. And so I think our challenge is to keep that going. The other thing I'm excited, two, two things if I may, uh, I'm excited about is this, this coalition. I believe strongly that if we're going to really uh, fix this problem, it's going to be through coalitions like this. And I just have to thank Mr. Dowling uh, for his amazing leadership and his inspiring words. I think it's a challenge to all of us. I'm also excited about research. There's a lot of exciting research going on, uh, but there needs to be more. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Daniel Webster. I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, this has been my lane for almost 30 years now. Uh, I have devoted principally my entire career focused on the prevention of gun violence and bringing the best research uh, to that uh, emergency. Uh, why is it a public health crisis and emergency right now? Um, well, uh, you, you know, the mortality statistics is, is just beginning uh, to explain why this is an emergency. Uh, we've seen rising rates of mass uh, shootings that uh, we, we sh should never cease to be shocked by that. But the reason it's a public health crisis for me, as someone who works and studies in Baltimore, is that there are many people living in communities where gun violence has been an epidemic for generations. It affects um, their longevity. Uh, it affects their mental health in very profound ways. It affects um, almost all aspects of their life. Um, and, and that should deeply disturb us and, and is, a, is a crisis if I ever know what a crisis is. What excites me is um, as far as some of the things that, that our doing, uh, we're doing at our center uh, at Johns Hopkins, um, we're we're um, focusing a lot on gun laws and what their impact is, and I think it's easy f to get very cynical when you see high rates of gun violence, and you can either sort of throw up your hands and either say, "Oh, well, these laws don't work," or "It's too politically hard." 
Well, we have some new research um, building on others that, that shows that um, a fairly simple idea of requiring licenses to get a, a, a firearm reduces about every form of gun violence that we're looking at. It reduces yeah. homicides it redu in urban areas and rural areas. It reduces suicides, even reduces law enforcement officers being shot in the line of duty. Um, and while this used to be too politically difficult to, to address, um, basically every, uh, if this is a, is this a uh, worthwhile barometer, but basically every serious Democratic presidential candidate is endorsed licensing. Um, we haven't seen that. Uh, so that is something to be excited about. I could go on, but the, that's the top of my list right now. And Dr. Bornstein, why do you believe this is a public health crisis at this point? Well, I think it meets the criteria of a public health crisis, and, and we don't have to look very far in our history to look at other public health crises that we have, I will say, addressed successfully. Uh, the two that are, seem to be discussed the most are uh, smoking-related behavior and also motor vehicle collisions. And um, uh, I'm old enough to remember the uh, birth of both of those movements, and uh, it's interesting, and this really ties back to research. If you look at this, the history of how smoking became culturally not the norm, but before it clearly was the norm, um, it was based on research. Um, a couple of national, of, of American Cancer Society researchers produced some very powerful cohort studies that said, it is clear that men who smoke have a, a shorter life expectancy than men who do not smoke. And that is really what propelled that to become national policy in 1964. The Surgeon General said, this is a health crisis. And so I think we have to have the data. We have to have the research. Um, the other thing is, but, but let me also say, it's estimated that those, that uh, declaration in 1964, along with cultural changes, clearly this is not simply a regulatory issue. Culture has to change. Probably has saved over 800,000 lives from deaths from lung cancer. Motor vehicle collisions, the same. Uh, remember, seatbelts were not mandatory until 1984. And there was a hue and cry. There were lawsuits. That was a terrible thing that the automobile manufacturers, and again, I hope that I'm not offending anybody, but the facts are auto automobile manufacturers very much were uh, dragged kicking and screaming into this. Uh, 1984, 1989, front seat, uh, front uh, airbags, probably 300,000 lives have been saved. But again, I think you've got to pair regulatory and cultural changes. So you mentioned research, and there's been some discussion of the Dickey Amendment and how that affects the CDC's ability to allocate funds for research. Do you think that that's impacted our ability to call this a public mm -hmm. health crisis? I, I think that um, lack of funding by CDC, the NIH, uh, has really been an impediment. I think we would be much further in our understanding about gun violence and what to do about it um, if, um, if we had invested as, as we would in any other public health crisis. Um, I, I do think that um, the letter of the law um, is really not the issue. The issue is the political will to actually appropriate funds um, and, and get those grants out. And uh, for too long, um, we've been at the mercy of the gun lobby on that. Um, thankfully, uh, there have been private funders who have stepped up and made a huge difference. Um, we published a book in 2013 after the crisis, uh, the horrible shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And uh, I just flipped through the book that we published and you know, almost all of it is funded by uh, private foundations, uh, some of the, those key, key studies. Dr. Bornstein, any comments yeah. about the Dickey Amendment? Sure, and I think, uh, as I understand it, um, Dr. Webster is, is much more an expert on this than, as I, than I, but I understand that Congress has clarified, essentially, that it was, it was not intended to restrict funding. However, there is no, there's not much funding, and so um, there is a bill in the House for, to, I think, add $150 million, I believe, to, uh, to gun research uh, 
violence prevention, but uh, that has not uh, passed in the House, in the Senate or been really even considered in the Senate. So I think that's a lesson to call your senator, okay? People need to tell people, and you need to look at people like Chris Murphy, right, from Connecticut, who unfortunately came, probably came to this for terrible, terrible reasons that you just alluded to. But there are people uh, like uh, Lucy McBath in Georgia who ran really on um, this issue. And so I think it's just, it's incumbent on us to really ask questions and to find people that are willing to, to take on this mantle. Well, that's what I was going to ask you as well. I mean, what can we do as providers and public policy health experts to use our influence to help change the provision? Well, you know, I, I think we just need to keep pounding away at this. I mean, just to look at a little bit on the bright side, um, you know, not that long ago, it was not on the advocacy agenda, right. the, this issue. And um, after the horrible shooting at, uh, in Parkland, Florida, when youth mobilized around this issue, it was, I, I at least noted that the number one thing uh, list on their policy goals was funding uh, research to address gun violence. I mean, that was stunning to me. So um, I have some degree of optimism. And the other uh, thing I think that we can do, sometimes with maybe more effect in the short term, is get states to fund this. Uh, some states are stepping up uh, to fill that void, um, and, and that's a common thing. Uh, Congress, on, on so many issues, guns in particular, um, does not uh, address its responsibilities, so states step in. But how do hospitals in both red and blue states grapple with the political differences that drive internal opposition from board members, employees, and benefactors? I'm looking at my good friend, Dr. Susan Bailey, who's the president-elect of the American Medical Association, who's a fellow Texan. Uh, and um, I think one of the ways you do it, again, is through coalitions. And um, I, I just need to mention um, the ACP uh, has put together, it's actually the second time we've done it, a coalition of, uh, really began by the six major um, medical organizations, the AMA, ACP, the pediatricians, family physicians, psychiatrists, and also the American Public Health Association came up with a call to action. And, and that's about 720,000 physicians that are represented. So if you think having that many, the leadership of that many organizations come together on, I think there are eight uh, principles, that's, that says something right there, I think. And I think um, last year, the American Cancer, oh, excuse me, the American College of Surgeons, Dr. Cools is here, had a really a historic um, uh, meeting. 44 medical uh, societies as well as American Bar Association came together in Chicago to, again, to, to have a, a call to action. So I think, um, I think that it, it's, it's a groundswell. I think the challenge is to keep it moving, keep it moving. With our news cycle and our attention spans, the way they tend to be, we have to keep, and we have to keep this, this momentum going. How do you think other public health emergencies uh, might help inform us about what steps to take to tackle gun violence? Um, the analogy that I, uh, find most compelling is to look at the amazing success story that we had in reducing drunk driving deaths. Yeah, um, I mean, there's overall there's a huge success in reducing deaths from motor vehicle crashes. I, I mentioned drunk driving specifically because the process. Uh, you had uh, a, a mobilized grassroots, uh, um, really strong coalition. Um, they partnered with research to make sure the things that they were advocating for worked. And very importantly, and this is maybe the most important lesson, I think, for, for gun violence prevention, is they weren't just about passing laws. They wanted to change the culture. Yeah. They wanted to fundamental change. And they worked through each of the systems that were relevant to that problem to change those systems and our culture. As, as uh, excited and encouraging as I am about this movement, I don't know that we're there yet. Uh, I, but I think we can get there. Is there anything we can learn from how healthcare tackled big tobacco and cigarettes? Yeah, I think we, we use, again, we use science. That's what you have to do. And I, I also think about, people don't talk about it as much, but in my lifetime, in my medical lifetime anyway, I think about HIV AIDS. Um, when I was a medicine resident, early 1990s, 
Uh, it was really literally a death sentence. We didn't really know much about it. We didn't understand the biology. We very b barely understood the transmission of it. We certainly had no treatments for it, but it was killing young people primarily, right? And so um, that was another moment where you saw all the organizations, whether it was uh, the CDC, the NIH, private public funding come together, it really race to find out more about this, this terrible uh, virus. And so now you look 25 years later, it's a chronic illness. And why? Because we came together as Americans with a common mission and we can do it. And I, I'd like to think that that can be a, a model for how we approach this. Are there any other practical steps that you think we can take in the healthcare industry to really push this forward and gain momentum? <laughs> um, so I have to give a shout out to my friend and colleague, Megan Ranney back there, who uh, you're gonna hear from, there she is, gonna hear from later. Megan is a force of nature, um, I'll just say that, and really has uh, really pushed the agenda and has is the uh, founder of a firm research, uh, private funding for, for research. So people like Megan and her colleagues, um, I also would say um, there's really good work out of University of California at Davis, Garen Wintemute, who's an emergency physician. I, I don't know, the, the emergency physicians, I like to think that the American College of Physicians has taken a strong stand on this, which we have, but I have to give kudos to the, to the ACEP too for the work that they've done. Um, a toolkit, okay, so, so one, of the, one of the challenges has been can physicians talk to their patients about this? And you all may remember in Florida a couple years ago, there were a series of lawsuits that were, there was an injunction to prevent pediatricians from talking to their patients about firearms. And after many years of, of struggle, that was finally overturned. And we, I can say here today, we do have the authority, we have the responsibility to talk to our patients. That is uncomfortable, uh, possibly, but think about it. Physicians do this every day. We ask about smoking, we ask about drinking, we ask about a lot of things. And so we need to incorporate that. And, and, and I would use the analogy that we know from, from data that when physicians, talk to their, when physicians talk to their patients about quitting smoking, they're much more likely to do so. We also know when physicians talk to their patients about firearm safety, it becomes a safer environment. So I think there are good parallels in history. Could, could I uh, just yeah. add um, something to that? Uh, the other very exciting thing going on is uh, hospitals responding to, um, when they are victims of gun violence, not simply to make sure that obviously they survive their wounds, but that they don't come back. And there's been enormous investment and in leadership in this room right here uh, to really address that the, the people who are shot um, they, they have lives of trauma, they, have, they, they need a lot of help and support, and uh, it's very encouraging to see that hospitals address uh, the, the, those needs. And it's not easy to do, and it's, uh, you know, my, again, my hat's off to them. Uh, the last thing I said, I, I'd like to say, is just the idea of uh, responsibilities for health in your communities can really transform what you do. You can start to do uh, cleaning and greening and addressing vacant homes and a lot of other things that's going on in communities when uh, all of a sudden our, you know, we, we shift our, our sites not just to treating some the people who come into healthcare, but what do we do for, on prevention? So two final questions. Uh, it appears that the U.S. Supreme Court will address gun violence for the first time since 2002. What role do you think the healthcare industry can play in this development? And last, what impact or legacy, you both have been obviously very involved in this, what impact or legacy do you hope to leave when it comes to this issue? Again, as far as the Supreme Court, um, I, I think we, we just need to continue our coalition building. We need to bring science. We need to bring data. Um, my, my legacy would be simple, and that would be to really eliminate this epidemic. I know we're never going to eliminate gun violence, uh, injury, and death completely, but as, as Mr. Dowling said so eloquently, this is not how we want to be. I, I just cannot believe that this is how we want to live in America. This cannot become the new norm. So. Science has played a very important role in court decisions. Um, I've been an expert um, in many uh, Second Amendment cases, 
And I'd like to think that we will continue to have judicial decisions at least partly informed by science. So we're going to have a role in that. Um, as far as sort of the legacy, honestly, I, I wasn't prepared for that, that question. Um, I, I feel so blessed being at Johns Hopkins because we get some of the greatest students in, in the country or the world come there. And um, I, I just feel very proud that we've been able to train a lot of the leaders, uh, not only on the research front, but on the prevention front. So, um, you know, I hope my research will inform what we do on this, this issue, but um, I, I have so much faith uh, in the students that come to us. Uh, that's, that's where, it, um, and, and you know, even the teenagers. I got to teach teenagers this summer. I, I normally teach graduate students, so that was fun. Thank you, Thank you both. Thank you both Thank for you. the incredible work you do, for the legacy you're gonna leave, and for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you.